Hi friends, welcome to Organic True Crime with Sydney Hopes, where I talk about interesting true crime stories. Um, sorry I've been gone for a while and just had a lot of stuff going on, but I'm back. And this month I'm going to be talking about uh, some cannibals. Today's is really interesting because I have a hard time deciding if she really wanted to do what she was doing or if she felt like she had to. So I'm just curious to see what you guys think. <laughs> we'll see. Today I'm going to be talking about a woman named Leonardo Tientuelli, and I'm so sorry if how just, I'm sorry about my pronunciation. I'm not Italian. I do my best. <laughs> so Leonardo is known for killing three women and using them to make tea cakes and also soap. That's why she's known as the soap maker of Correggio. Our story takes place in early 1900s Italy. So there is a lot to be said about Leonardo's parents and their background, but I wanted to keep the focus of the video on Leonardo, so I'm only going to touch on them briefly. Briefly. So Leonardo's mother, Emilia, came from a very wealthy family, and in the late 1890s, she was sexually assaulted by a much older, very poor alcoholic man named Mariano Cianciuelli. And after some time, it became apparent that Emilio was pregnant and she was basically just forced to marry Mar oh, Mariano to try not to bring shame on her family. In April 1894, Leonardo was born into a very unhappy and unstable home. She spent most of her early childhood moving around through from different housing that basically the church provided for their family because her very abusive father didn't ever really have a job or make much of an effort to support his family. Um, she also suffered from emotional abuse from her mother, who basically blamed Leonardo for everything that was wrong in her life. So obviously not a very positive environment for a young girl to grow up in. And it was very common uh, for Mariano to stay out for several days and just not come home because of his drinking. Um, but there was one specific time when Leonardo was very young that Mariano had been gone for an unusually long amount of time, a long period of time. So Emilio went looking for him and he ended up being at one of his friend's house in a coma. So she, Emilia, brought him home and basically just put him in a room and ignored him until he died. Shortly after Mariano's death, Emilia did remarry. And this marriage provided a little bit more stability for the family, but the they still didn't have much money, and the emotional abuse from Amelia still continued. And at this point, Leonardo claims to basically just have been left to fend for herself most of the time. She was just ignored by her parents most of the time. When Leonardo was 13 years old, she attempted to take her own life by um, hanging herself with her bed sheets. Um, it was unsuccessful, but she did end up having severe bruising around her neck and she was unable to speak for a few days. And Leonardo claims that her parents never said anything. They never asked her about it or even noticed that this happened. Um, it was never addressed. And then about a year later, she tried again the same way and the same thing happened. Leonardo eventually found another way to escape her situation. She eventually met a man named Raphael Pansard, and he was a little bit older than her, and he was working as a registry office clerk, so he didn't make a whole lot of money, but she didn't care. She was in love. And when she announced her plans of marriage to her mother, Amelia, she was met with an extremely negative response. And Amelia basically told Leonardo that she was going to live a miserable life. And Leonardo, who was known for being very super who was known for being very superstitious, took this as a curse on her marriage. And it might have been meant that way. Nobody really knows. Um, but Leonardo took it to heart and felt that her mother had cursed her marriage. What she didn't know was that Amelia was so upset because she had plans for Leonardo, plans that she never informed Leonardo of, because why would she? Um, basically, Amelia was looking for a wealthy husband for Leonardo so that they could move up the social ladder and she could get closer to what she once had. But she never told Leonardo about it because it didn't actually have anything to do with her. 
So surprise, surprise, she found someone else and got married and was happy. So in her early 20s, Leonarda married Raphael Pansard, and she never spoke to her mother again. And she really didn't worry about the curse too much until the couple started trying to have children. And this is when she started turning all the blame onto her mother's curse. So throughout their marriage, Leonardo became pregnant 17 times. Three of these ended in miscarriages. Seven of these children died before the age of three. And three of them, three more of them died before becoming adults. So out of 17 pregnancies, the couple ended up with four children. Leonardo became extremely protective of her four children, understandably so. Um, she had always been known for having high anxiety, which sometimes led to seizures, and this just got worse with the constant worry for her children's lives. She also believed in palm reading and fortune tellers and visited them as often as she could. It was usually through traveling groups. Um, but at one point, she was told by a fortune teller that she would outlive all of her children, and that did not help with her paranoia and her anxiety. So she basically never let her children out of her sight, ever. They didn't go anywhere. In the mid-1920s, the family was struggling financially, and they really needed Leonardo to have a job. Um, so to work around her need to constantly supervise her children, Raphael found Leonardo a job cleaning a bank at night. So she would put the kids to bed and then go and work while Raphael was home with them. And it was going pretty well until Leonardo decided to use her job to steal money from the bank. She basically gained access somehow to the bank's ledger and created an account under her name with a large amount of money in it and then came back during the day and tried to take some out. Um, it didn't work. They were immediately suspicious and she was pretty quickly arrested. In 1927, Leonardo was convicted of fraud and sentenced to a year and a half of jail but they didn't really have a whole lot of jail available for women at the time. I guess Italy didn't have a lot of female criminals in the 1920s. So she was actually sent to a nunnery for 18 months to serve out her sentence. After Leonardo's release, she her interest in palm readings and fortune telling became an obsession. And she actually ended up learning how to read palms. Um, but their family also had to move because... They weren't trusted anymore and people kind of shamed them. And I'm pretty sure her husband also lost his job when she was caught. So the family had to move. So in 1930, Leonardo and her family and most of the village that they were living in were all participating in the harvest. Um, which basically meant everybody in the village was harvesting the fields and then they would all sleep out in the fields and then wake up and continue which was very lucky because in 1930, the Irpina earthquake struck. Um, it was a 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale and was um, classified as being very destructive. Um, their entire village was completely destroyed. So luckily there were a lot less deaths than there normally would be from an earthquake this large because most of the village was out in the fields and not in the town where it mainly struck. But after this, their family had no home, they had nowhere to live, and they had to move again and find somewhere new to live. And as uh, refugees from this earthquake, they were able to find housing in Correggio. Um, they lived in, it was basically had like a shop front, but also a living quarters, and that's where um, Leonardo and her family moved. Raphael was able to find a job in this town, and uh, Leonardo actually opened a soap shop in the little storefront that they had connected to their home and it did really well. They really, she really made a name for herself and the family found some stability that they had been looking for. And eventually the women that visited Leonardo's soap shop also started visiting her for advice and basically fortune telling because like I said, she had learned to read palms. Um, and during this time, Leonardo was still seeking out palm readers and fortune tellers and Somewhere in this time, a palm reader told her that in one hand, she saw a criminal asylum and then the other prison. So, really great to hear from your fortune teller, right? Okay, now we're going to talk about Leonardo's oldest son, Giuseppe, for a second. Giuseppe was her first child to that she carried all the way through pregnancy and that survived all the way to adulthood. He was her favorite and very, very special to her. 
So she, again, was known for being very over protective of her children, but especially so when it came to Giuseppe. He was her everything. And in 1939, he decided to join the Italian army, which was at the time preparing for World War II. And that obviously terrified his mother. Again, kind of understandably so. So she felt that she needed to do everything that she could in order to protect her son who was going off to war. Leonardo did try to see if there was a way to get her son out of joining, but that was not really an option. So her next choice, which she found through her studies and her personally, personal beliefs, she felt her next option was to perform a human sacrifice, basically a life for a life to protect her son. And she had until November of 1940 when he would be leaving. And she felt um, that she needed to protect him both inside and out. So she needed to not only perform a human sacrifice, but then use them to create food to feed her son and soap to wash his exterior with. And she knew that she had women coming in and out of her shop constantly. And they came to her for advice and trusted her. So she knew she had options. Faustina Setti was one of these women who frequented the shop and often came just for advice from Leonardo. Now, Faustina was over the age of 40. I'm not exactly sure how old different sources say different ages, um, but definitely over 40 and had never been married, which at the time was kind of weird. And she was known around town as a spinster. Oh, no. In late 1939, Faustina was told that Leonardo had found her a husband. He was a man that lived out of town, and Faustina would have to move um, without having met him first, but she was totally okay with that because, like I said, at that time, it was really frowned upon for a woman of her age not to be married. Leonardo told her that she couldn't tell anyone um, that she was leaving, but she had her write some letters and postcards to her family explaining why she would have left to send afterwards. Not really sure how that made sense, but I guess it did because she did write these letters. And then she packed all her bags and she gathered all her life savings, getting ready to move in with her new husband. And she stopped by Leonardo's place to say goodbye. And this is when Leonardo offered her a cup of wine and Faustina gladly accepted. Leonardo had drugged this wine and after Faustina finished her cup, Leonardo killed her with an axe. I do think it's important to remember that Leonardo wasn't doing this out of hate or out of some fantasy that she needed to fulfill. She was doing it because she, I, I believe, she truly thought that it was the only way that she could ensure her son's safety. And I guess she felt that her son was more important than other people and he deserved to be safe. I don't know. To him, I'm sure she wa he was. To her, to her, I'm sure he was. Jeez. Anyway, so when it came down to it, Leonardo couldn't even look at Faustina while she swung her axe, which led to a, for lack of a better word, very messy job. After this, Leonardo dismembered Faustina's body. She drained her blood and used that to bake into tea cakes. There wasn't a whole lot left because, like I said, she didn't do a very clean job of it. Um, but she did use what was there to bake into tea cakes that she would then serve to not only Giuseppe, but also visitors and her family and herself. They all ate them. And she said they were very dry and kind of tasted like iron made with blood. Anyway, and the rest of the body she put into a giant pot with caustic soda, which she used to render animal fat to make soap. Um, and she tried to do the same thing to make soap out of the remains. But it didn't work. It didn't break down properly. It turned into a really dark, sludgy material that she couldn't use to make soap. So she actually had her son dispose of these into a nearby septic tank, but she didn't tell him what it was. She just, well, I guess it wasn't that weird because she used animals for her soaps, so he didn't really question it. I don't know. But because of this, she felt that it didn't work. Her sacrifice didn't go through. She only did part of it. She fed it to him, but she didn't have the exterior protection, and that meant she would have to do it again. I apologize for any weird noises you may hear. My dog is just right here trying to get attention. Um, 
1940, uh, just a few months before Giuseppe was supposed to leave, Leonardo planned her human sacrifice for a second time. And she again chose a woman that often frequented the shop. This time, it was a woman named Francesca Sovi. And again, I'm very sorry for my pronunciation. Francesca was told that Leonardo had found a teaching job for her out of town, and it was the same deal. She couldn't tell anyone about it, but she should go ahead and write some letters and postcards. And then she packed all her bags, gathered all her savings, and came to visit Leonardo before leaving. She was also offered a drugged cup of wine, which she took and drank. And this is when Leonardo killed Francesca with an axe. And this time she put some buckets around her beforehand so she was able to collect more blood and make less of a mess. And again, she made tea cakes, but again, she got very dry and iron tasting tea cakes. She still served these to Giuseppe and her family and women that visited her and herself. And she again tried to use the remains to break down in caustic soda and make soap. But it didn't work again. The same thing happened. She got a very dark and sludgy, unusable liquid and had to dispose of it. So at this point, she starts questioning, like, obviously she's doing something wrong because this should work and this has to work. It's her only option. And then she realizes it's because these women were people she knew, but not really people that she cared about. So in reality, it wasn't much of a sacrifice, not to her. It needed to be someone that was important to her so that it truly was a, a, a sacrifice, a life for a life, someone that she cared about for someone else that she cared about, right? So a few weeks later, Leonardo plans a human sacrifice for the third time. This time, Leonardo chose a woman named Virginia Kachikovi. I'm so sorry, I know. Virginia. She was a singer who at the time was living with her brother and his wife while she was looking for another singing job. Before living in Correggio, she um, was a soprano for the opera house in Florence called La Scala. Um, so she was pretty well known, um, kind of a small town celebrity in the area. And she frequented Leonardo's shop, but she also seeked advice and then eventually the two became kind of close they were both pretty well known around town kind of little celebrities and they enjoyed each other's company so the two women did become pretty close and in late september 1940 leonardo told virginia of a singing job an out of town singing job that she had found for her and she again was told not to tell anyone about it and to just write some letters and postcards and she gathered her, all her bags and her life savings and she went to Leonardo's house to say goodbye. And again, she was offered, offered a cup of drugged wine. And apparently it was a little more difficult. She didn't really want the wine and it took some convincing, but she did eventually take it and drink it. And this is when, for a third time, Leonardo committed murder with an ax. And this time she again collected the blood and made tea cakes and said her tea cakes were delicious they were very moist and they didn't have any hint of iron it turned out great and she took the rest of virginia's remains and broke them down in caustic soda and got the result that she was looking for and ended up making what was known to be her best batch of soap yet um she's quoted as saying that it was extremely creamy another difference with Virginia and the first two women was Virginia had a family and they wondered where she went. She lived with people. She was known around town and then just all of a sudden she disappeared. So people questioned it. And very soon after Virginia's disappearance, her sister-in-law started looking into things and she ended with several witnesses that saw Virginia going into Leonardo's house on the night of her disappearance and not one single witness seeing her leave. So she took that information to the police and they went and questioned Leonardo who said that nothing happened. But then they searched Leonardo's home and this is when they found the belongings of Faustina Setti and Francesca Sovi and Virginia Cacicopi. Uh, I'm not gonna try it again, I can't do it. I apologize again for my pronunciation. So police at first 
didn't really believe that that Leonardo could have committed these. I mean, she's an older woman, right? She can't do these kinds of things. They thought that it was either Raphael or Giuseppe. Um, but as soon as the police started questioning Giuseppe, Leonardo came forward and said, absolutely not. He had nothing to do with it. It was all me. And she provided details to the police saying that it was in fact her. But still, they were not very sure that a woman could have completed all of these tasks on her own, as she said. So in order to prove herself, she was, I, this is crazy to me. She was given a cadaver to dismember, which she did with obvious experience. And that is when police started taking her seriously and she was arrested for three murders. At this point, Leonardo didn't mind coming forward because to her, her job was done. She had made sure her son was protected. He ate the tea cakes and she had personally made sure to it that he, every inch of his exterior body was protected by the soap. I'm not going to go into that too much. Um, so... She, she was not too worried about going to jail. And in 1946, she was tried and convicted for three murders. She was sentenced to 30 years in prison plus three years in an asylum. And her son, Giuseppe, never spoke to her again after this. And I, I'm not sure how to feel about that. I think if I had been asked a few years ago, I would have been like, absolutely. Of course, he didn't speak to her again. She's a murderer. But now, as a mom... I, it kind of, she did all of that for him. She wasn't, it's not, again, it's not like she was fulfilling some fantasy or angry at people and decided to do this. She was trying to protect him and she truly felt that that was the only way to do it. And I'm not saying she was right to have done that. I'm not agreeing with her. She was obviously not mentally well. But to just not talk to her ever again, I don't know. That's, I don't, I don't know how to feel about that. And if you're wondering if it worked, her human sacrifice worked, um, it's pretty much assumed that it didn't. Um, Giuseppe, there's basically, there's record of him in the war up to a certain point, and then it just stops and there's nothing. So it's kind of assumed that he died, but there's no actual record of his death. So it's possible that he didn't. Um, her other three children did change their names and moved and continued on their lives as other people. So it's possible he did that. I'm just... I don't think it's very likely that mid-war he was able to change his name. I don't know, maybe if you want to be hopeful, you can say that he did. In 1970, Leonardo died at age 79 of complications from a stroke, basically. She was in an asylum at the time and had a stroke and died shortly after. All of her axes and the bucket that she used um, to break down the bodies... And basically all of her tools that she used are can be found in the Criminology Museum in Rome. Great. Um, and also she wrote a cookbook that is still used today. People still reference it. It's like a, a classic Italian cooking. I don't know. Anyway. And that is the story of Leonardo, the soap maker of Correggio. And... When I first started reading it, when I first started looking into it just as like a cannibal story, was, it's like, oh, this woman's horrible. She killed three women and then cooked them into tea cakes and fed them to various people. But when you actually start looking into it and the background and the reasons that she did it, it becomes so much more complicated because it's, I find it difficult to just, I always, I always find it difficult just to hate them and see a, them as a bad person because it's not usually done without reason. I don't know. And in this case, and like, like I said, it's not like I'm saying it's right what she did. I'm not agreeing with it, but I do see how it led to that, how being ignored and abused for your whole childhood can lead you to really, really, really care about the people that do show you love and your children who show you unconditional love, at least in the beginning, um, who you will do absolutely anything for. And because of her experiences and her own personal beliefs I do think that she truly felt that that was her only option and I don't know I just have a really hard time deciding because she did she killed three women that absolutely did not deserve that and then not only did that but fed them to other people that she knew and sold the soaps to people that she knew like it, it's it's not I don't know and it, but so it's kind of hard to also say that she just did it for her son because 
why I guess she didn't want to waste. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think and I'll see you again soon for more cannibal stories. My dog is climbing across me. I'm sorry. Bye. See you next time.